we're happy to have the chalk talks every week. I know it's really been great for our students who some of them are, are, are all are not in the New York area. We've got plenty that are around the United States and in Europe and in Asia. And this is a way to connect with the university and its faculty um, and talk about various things each week. There's been some really good discussion um, in this hour over the past few weeks. Um, some of which I, I find that I, I feel like the student because of some of the things have gone way over my head. But here we are at, at 502, so I'll start off the discussion. Um, welcome everybody to uh, the October 7th NYU Tisch Institute for Global Sport um, Chalk Talk. Um, we're here for an hour to talk about sports finance and facilities in the post COVID era. Um, you'll see that I have invited um, two individuals to help me along in this. Um, Jim Leonard, um, who is a partner at Fager Drinker. I'm going to ask Jim to introduce himself in a second. And Willie de Blasi, who is um, also a principal here at Inner Circle Sports, uh, who works with me quite closely at Inner Circle on sports facility finance. And so Willie's a former Goldman um, and, uh, banker. I won't hold that against him. And uh, um, I'll ask him to introduce himself as, as well. We are going to talk about um, the really what's going on in the world of sports, sort of the roller coaster ride that we're on right now of do we have fans? Do we not have fans? Who's in? Who's out? What's it doing to sports? Um, who's, who are the big players in finance? Um, where's money coming from? And we're going to spend a little bit of time sort of drilling down on that. And then um, I, we'll talk about how people are managing their development of facilities to, to, and in fact, just fit the bill as to how people use sports facilities, how people um, come and go through them, um, what's changed in the COVID area, what's accelerated and what's sort of slowed down a little bit. But before I do that, Jim, why don't you, you take the floor, why don't you introduce yourself and then Willie, and then I'm going to hand it back to Jim with an interesting question on what's, how the impact of, of COVID has, uh, has, has made some changes in our business. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, my name is Jim Leonard. I'm a uh, partner with the law firm of Fagery, Drinker, Biddle and Reef. Um, I'm in our Denver office. We represent uh, amateur, professional uh, sports teams throughout the country and uh, work with uh, cities and uh, other actors kind of across the entire spectrum of sports. Uh, David and I actually have been fortunate to work together on a number of venues together, including the most recent uh, home of the uh, Kraken in uh, Seattle for uh, the NHL. Um, I uh, personally have uh, been the outside uh, general counsel, not general counsel, but outside counsel for the Colorado Rockies for 20 years. Um, but also through that time, I've also done a lot of Olympic work and have worked with the United States Olympic Committee, as well as a lot of national governing bodies for both summer and winter Olympic sports. And so the summer sports is something that I think will be an interesting uh, deal to talk about when we uh, start talking about you know, how all this started to come down. Cool, Willie, go ahead. Sure. Um, first, thank you, uh, thank you again for having me. Um, you know, I, as, uh, as as David mentioned, uh, I'm a principal at Inner Circle Sports, uh, and David and I work closely together uh, with a focus on uh, sports finance uh, and stadium and arena uh, advisory and finance work. Um, so prior to joining Inner Circle, I spent 10 years at Goldman uh, with a similar focus. Uh, on uh, stadium and arena finance globally. Uh, I've worked on projects uh, all throughout the U.S. Uh, and throughout Europe. Uh, did the Sacramento Kings uh, New Arena Golden One Center. Uh, worked with uh, the Yankees on some of their financings. Uh, Barclays Center, uh, a number of MLS financings, as well as, uh, you know, with Tottenham. Uh, so really uh, spanned the globe in terms of the, the projects that I've worked on. Uh, and, uh, you know, definitely excited to be here and, and uh, hopefully share some thoughts on, on what's an interesting time in our world. Fantastic. Fantastic. I already see questions coming in from one from our, our, our colleague at, at NYU, Len DeLuca, who was a, um, is an icon in the sports media business. He's got a good one for us. I'll pose that in, in, in a few minutes. So we're going to first talk about um, how sports has been impacted most in the COVID area. And, and Jim, why don't you kick it off? Uh, you know, you, you've, uh, you've said to me, we're, the elevator's going down for the time being. Yeah, right. 
Well, uh, actually, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, the, the USOC's general counsel, Chris McCleary, and uh, so I'll, I'll have to give that trademarked phrase to him. But uh, uh, whenever we've been sitting around, in, including when all this started happening uh, and, and became more than just this is something happening across the ocean and, and, and started becoming very real in uh, February and then uh, definitely at the beginning of uh, March. And in fact, one of my friend's mothers was uh, the presumptive COVID case number one here in Colorado. So um, th that started to hit, to hit really close to home uh, at, at the beginning of March and the first week of March. So this the, the elevator down, I think, is everybody's kind of uh, individual and unique story for how this came to pass. But there, there does seem to be a uh, D-Day, which was uh, March 11th, which happened to be my wife's birthday as well, too. And as we were leaving a dinner, uh, you know, on the news, Adam Silver was canceling the NBA season. Um, and then obviously in the next uh, couple days after that, everybody followed suit. Um, interesting thing, um, I do a lot of summer Olympic sports as well, too. And, and you know, the Olympics, at least when you're looking at the quad cycle, which is there, um, the, the Olympics might as well have been the next day. Um, the way that Olympic organizations work for both uh, revenue and uh, just in general, their sport while the sport is 365 days uh, a, a year, uh, really the buildup is two years in advance and the year uh, in advance of the games is really where you're, you're, you're in hyperdrive. Um, and so a, a lot of people were sitting there looking at having trials in the coming uh, weeks, qualifying races, and other things like that to get ready for Japan. And uh, the conversations I was having with people that night and at the wee hours and throughout the weekend, uh, you know, all centered around what everybody in the sports world was looking like. Uh, I don't care whether it's youth sports or professional sports or Olympic. Uh, people were looking at, um, at first, trying to figure out how they maybe could move events. Um, uh, no one really, while the, while the leagues had canceled, I think everybody else was still trying to figure out, you know, how, how can we postpone things? How can we move things? And, and uh, it became readily apparent in the couple of weeks after that, that everything was going to have to go into a full shutdown. And, and, and the things that um, really provided the, the, the impetus for all of these discussions are still what we're looking at today. Um, state and local governmental orders, um, liability and insurance issues, um, sanctioning issues, uh, particularly in the amateur sports world, and then contractual liabilities and obligations, whether it's media contracts um, or, or sponsorship agreements, anything that has to do with revenue uh, was impacted immediately and in a very uncertain manner. And, and while we've been able to get through uh, certain of the professional seasons here, um, it still is a, is a major question mark as we look at uh, people taking interim measures here. What is this going to look like next year? So I, I think that elevator down is, uh, I don't know if we've hit the bottom of it yet. And I think that that's what the big question is out there, David. And I know yeah. we sit around trying to answer it and go, have we hit the bottom of it? I, I'm, I'm a glass half full guy, but I don't think we have because we don't know what next year is going to look like. We right. don't know what the broadcasters are going to do. We don't know what sponsors are going to do. Everybody's kind of taking a, hey, we're going to work it out this year. But if this continues, it's going to be a, a much more magnified issue. I think lenders and people are generally putting money into sports like stability. They like certainty and, and, and cash flow has really been impacted by that. Willie, you're looking at a lot of different mm -hmm. deals out there. I mean, what what is everybody looking at from a contractually obligated income standpoint, from a cash flow standpoint, because certainty is out the window at this point? Right? <laughs> uh, that, that's exactly right. Um, and, and, you know, most facilities are, are built, you know, just like general infrastructure financing on that contractually obligated income. And so the question is, you know, one, you know, how good are those contracts if the, you know, buildings and the clubs are unable to deliver on the content that underlies it? Um, and, and that's very fundamental to these credits. I, I will say overall, um, you know, outside of, you know, sort of the very uncertain period, you know, March into May, call it, when it wasn't even clear that we were going to be able to have sports content on television, um, absent that period, um, you know, the market has stabilized a little bit and, and lenders really sort of look to, you know, how are you going to get through the crunch period of, you know, certainly 2020 and 2021 uh, and some even into, you know, 2022. So, you know, once you get past those liquidity issues, I think lenders are, are fairly comfortable with the long term prospects of, of sport. Uh, but certainly the question is, you know, what happens to 
that income, you know, in, in the next year or two years. And, you know, we're starting to see how some of it has played out in 2020, but I think there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty as we go into a, you know, another full season, uh, potentially of these types of disruptions. I, I just wonder about, you know, all the sports playing without fans, or at least with a minimal amount of fans do they you know, how are they changing their revenue picture in terms of, you know, what tech, what's changing in technology? What are the media um, outlets doing to supplant the revenue that's coming from local you know, ticket sales and food and beverage sales and 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 uh, and and, and non-consumable items in, in facilities right now. How are we? How how are they managing to sort of get revenue through the you know through the door? Well, David, the one thing and, and Willie, the one thing you need to focus on as well too uh, is is looking at both within the hierarchy of professional sports from MLS up to NFL. I mean, MLS is just going to get killed because they rely on the gate. Um, amateur sports, and, and if the Olympics gets knocked off the schedule, it's going to have major ripple effects. So, you know, will I be interested to see from a from from a lender's standpoint and others in terms of that contractually obligated uh, income? You know, it's one thing to talk about sponsorships; it's another thing to talk about gate. And well, you know, Jim, MLS you work in the Olympic in the Olympic business quite a bit. Um, what's the percentage of revenues that come from ticket sales versus worldwide media? Um, and can they, can they make a go of it if there's limited uh, ticket sales for the Olympics next year? Well, the Olympics is, 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 a, is, is a, a different animal in terms of from, from the upper level. I mean, you got to realize too, in, in understanding the, the structure of the Olympics, you know, you start out with the IOC on top and, and then all of the, the, the country governing bodies that are there like the USOPC. I mean, essentially the Olympics is just a massive contractual arrangement is, is what it is with everybody subcontracting for the other. The issue that you have uh, at, at a base level um, with people getting affected or the national governing bodies, uh, you know, the cyclings, the swimmings and other things like that. Some uh, are just historically not in a good position and, and revenue is an issue every single day. Some uh, are very well positioned, but of the 50 national governing bodies, there's probably, you know, under 10 that are very well positioned. And so the money that uh, is supposed to be coming into the USOC some of which gets distributed out to the national governing bodies. There's some governing bodies that are just, I don't wanna say they're wholly dependent on it, but, but that's a major source of their income. Others uh, are, are more like a professional sports organization where they have uh, money coming in primarily from sponsorships and other things like that. Ticket sales and events usually tend to be a break even for them. So it's a little bit different calculus. You, you get to the USOC side, the USOC doesn't uh, do anything like that again, because uh, the sports uh, are the ones that basically subcontract that out and, and they do it. The, the USOC is dependent on uh, their sponsorships and things like that. So that's affected by the games. They're having the same issues that uh, every other sports organization is having. They're having to make goods for things that are potentially down a year. And you have uh, all sports are running into the same issue where people, particularly sponsors, uh, not all of them, I, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised on both sides of the equations where people are are working together, but but in the Olympic space, even more so than the professional space, those sponsorships are huge. And 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 if you've got a sponsor that says, hey, this year's kind of a nothing year and we, we need a free year, that's a year out of your revenue and cuts into your next quad. Um, the IOC and the USOC and others, you know, they're dependent on, you know, at least the USOC, that NBC money, and not all that money's coming in, right? And we don't know what's going to happen with next year. As, as a local organizing committee, um, Japan, uh, there's, there's been press on that. I mean, they're, they're still pushing ahead. They've cut back about $300 million in expenses, kind of most recently reported. But, um, you know, the, the, those events are not necessarily made to make a profit off of people walking in there. That's sponsorships and media. And, you know, Willie, with... You know, there's such a vast difference between collegiate and professional sports, especially in Olympic sports. I mean, from a venue standpoint, you know, what's the difference of, 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 lo of looking forward to building a professional sports venue versus a collegiate sports venue and thinking what Jim was saying in terms of the uncertainty of who is going to be coming to those buildings. Len DeLuca, one of our, 
our faculty members who uh, is, a, is a dear friend said, what about building a basketball court on a college campus or you know, an arena, I'm assuming? You know, will you arena. ever see, yeah, will you ever see, you know, a, a, a university building a stadium on its own nickel anymore? Is it always going to be a P3? So what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely an interesting time in terms of how you know folks are going to view what the appropriate way to fund a project like this is. Um, you know, I, I I think personally that you know there has been a move in the collegiate space you know towards you know P three uh, or project finance type structures uh, on these buildings, and I think as uh, you know as the budgetary situation of universities generally. Uh, you know, start to become more clear over the course of, of the next year or so, I, I think people will realize that it does make sense to look at this either as a P3 or in a self-sustaining uh, project finance type structure. Um, and, and I think that has worked well uh, for the professional sports that have been able to, you know, uh, continue down that road. And, and I think there's a big market for that in the collegiate space. Uh, definitely. And and so I think the, the jury might be out a little bit uh, in terms of how people are thinking about it. But uh, certainly uh, those, those different structures can can be attractive, uh, you know, as, as an option. Well, things were cooking along really nicely about a year ago. I know Jim and I are working on things. We, we're surprised at the level of interest of banks in, in, in projects. I know Willie, you as well, before we joined, joined forces. I mean, just money was flowing into business. But in, into the sports business now very, very fragmented. When does the industry get back to growth, you know, in numbers, you know, when are fans at live events? What, you know, this is a loaded question, by the way, and I'll, I'll, I'll go third, but Jim, when do you think, you know, people are back in, in the, in, into coming to events where money flows back into the sports business at the pace it was flowing, um, say in 2018, 20, early 2019? Well, I mean, if we if we kind of focus on people too that have a uh, a reliance on gate, that that's going to be people getting back in and and to go back to um, the 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 factors that kind of brought um, everything to a shutdown are the factors that are influencing what happens moving forward. And so, I think that from a uh, from from a state standpoint, again, you know, with whatever the CDC state and local orders are you know to be able to get people back and everybody's reading this every day i mean uh, the green bay packers announced yesterday that in, in, until things change they're not going to have anybody come back and and there's other owners dallas <laughs> who would have a hundred thousand people in, in in their venue and so um the, the ad hoc nature of this kind of makes it a team by team and, and does present uncertainty you know for 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 the leagues um, when you go back and you take a look, I mean, the big thing for baseball was to be able to get a season, even if truncated, so that you could get to the postseason. That's where the money is. It's not so much the money, you know, it's helpful for the teams for the money that's coming in for the RSNs and things like that. But those big uh, national media contracts to be able to get to the postseason, particularly in baseball, that's when all the money rolls into the leagues and such. And so, uh, again, that, that, that's, that, that's a different deal uh, and we all know that NFL is a, its own completely different animal. I mean, you don't necessarily need fans there. It's nice, but that's not going to make or break a team. It's going to kill a team like we've talked about with MLS or yeah. in, in some of these others where you're very heavily reliant um, on, uh, on gate. And in terms of getting people back in, you know, how these orders look like, what do they look like on a, on a state by state basis? We all know I don't think there's going to be anything uniformly from from a national standpoint. There there is from 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 my standpoint, doing a lot of uh, venues and events and things like that. There's a trend happening and and um, kind of obvious states, if you will, um, where there's um, kind of statutory immunity for state actors and then for other people, uh, kind of a limited immunity. It's, it's akin to the batted ball statues. I mean, we all know about those. I mean, in order to get owners to come in. Uh, particularly in baseball, where the term comes from, that, uh, that, that, that individuals associated with the team have basically tort immunity 
uh, you know, somebody's getting hit by baseballs or other things are happening where people get injured uh, in the stands. And, and that all works into ultimately project financing as well, too, because you get the owners who come in, they want to spend money to build stadiums, you get people to get involved in P3s. I mean, it's one of these foundations that people aren't going to walk into an event and get sick and then go sue you for hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And so I think what we're seeing um, in, in a variety of states, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Utah, Wyoming, by the last count I had, where you're, you're seeing this codification of essentially what's assumption of risk type of, uh, of concepts that you see when you go out and you sign a release or a waiver, when you zip line or rent sports equipment or do whatever, um, that they're saying that if you have signage out there, if you have things on your tickets and such, there's a presumption that um, because COVID is a dangerous disease, um, that if you uh, walked in and you just assume the risk of getting it. And so, again, go back to Willie's point. I, I mean, I think that uh, those are, um, you know, interim types of measures. And, and do people really think that this is going to go on for 10 years? I mean, I, I think we hope it's, it, it doesn't. But I think what everyone's trying to do here is kind of take that uncertainty out so that our operators will go out and, and, and operate and, and provide that bridge to normalcy. And, and in getting to that bridge of normalcy, that, that's one. The, the, the other is the insurance industry. And the insurance industry is just, you know, getting batted around here. Um, there, there's, there's an amazing amount of suits that, that are in various stages of litigation for business interruption. The leagues are bringing them um, where they're saying that they're insured for the loss of revenue that happened. There's blanket exem uh, uh, exemptions for pandemics and endemics and things like that. And this is all making its way up through the court system. Minor League Baseball uh, has a huge uh, one that uh, was uh, just had a ruling against it in the past few weeks. Um, so the idea of, of getting people back in and getting to normalcy is, is, um, is there going to be protection for the business owners? And I, I think uh, the, the states are doing that through legislation. The insurance companies are going to be a wild card here. There's a lot of insurance companies that are saying that they may have insured for communicable diseases, including COVID. But now, as uh, and particularly in sports, you see a lot of annual renewals. Um, and those have been coming up in September. And there's been a lot of, we're not going to insure over that. And so getting people back in is uh, going to be dependent on that, that, hey, I, I may be able to get people back in. I may be able to abide by state and local orders. But there may just be too much risk, which is out there until uh, there's a, a, a cure that's there. And I think that's the decision that you saw Regal make yesterday on theaters where they just threw their hands up and said, we're not going to do it. And I think um, it's an analogous situation for sports. All the really big money invested movies like the James Bond movie and others, which have been getting moved down are now moved out to next April. Um, and, and these are not movies that people feel like they're going to make their investment back by putting it on Netflix and charging 20 bucks or, you know, kind of whatever it is. Those need to be theatrical releases to get their money back. And I think sports owners are looking at the same calculus there as well, too. So, again, as long as as long as there's this uncertainty and we do have this kind of bridge to normalcy, um, you know, I think things will move on. But um, it, as I said at the beginning, I, people don't know what the answer is. And, and that's what kind of disrupts this, uh, this, this um, certainty that we need for financing and other things like this at the level that we're Willie. talking about. Willie, while you're thinking about what you're going to say, maybe uh, add in also like the music industry. How's that, you know, how is that influencing both attendance at sports facilities and like what's going on on that side of the, uh, of, of the equation? The, the yeah, music I, you know, I, horrible. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's certainly, uh, the music industry certainly is in a difficult, uh, place, you know, as an increasing amount of, uh, of their revenue is coming from touring and, and the live business as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to record sales and distribution. So certainly that presents a challenge. Um, you know, the way that, that I kind of think about, um, you know, what the future has to hold in, in terms of people coming back into, into stadiums uh, and arenas is, is, is sort of twofold. One is, you know, there's the, the health concern, uh, you know, which, which Jim, you talked about quite a bit. And then the second one is what, what's the impact of, of the economic stress that people might be under uh, in, in, at this time. So one, are people going to be able 
uh, you know, from a health perspective or be comfortable to, to go to facilities? And then two, are they going to have the disposable income, you know, in, in, in order to do it, you know, once they do feel comfortable? Uh, you know, and I think, Jim, as you mentioned, there's much less uh, certainty around, you know, when the, the health issues are, are going to be resolved or if they will be resolved. Um, and, and on the economic side, you know, I think you have some data, pretty good data from, uh, you know, historical downturns that that actually sports are, you know, pretty steady uh, in economic downturns. So I wouldn't expect that to be, uh, you know, have, have a major drag, but but certainly will have an impact. Um, in most of the work that that we've been doing as, you know, teams and buildings look at, you know, when they think they'll be back at you know, expected capacity, um, you know, and growth from the 2019 levels, uh, you know, it, it, it's a few years out, I would, you know, 23, 24 is kind of the range where people are thinking if, you know, we, we can make progress on the health side, you know, those might be the years when you can start to see people coming back in a real way, um, you know, that they were previously. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty to get there. Um, but, but I would say that the movement has been, you know, away from this is a, this is a one year blip to, you know, how are we going to make adjustments to be able to survive, you know, two, three years and, and you know, not just survive, but, but make some money. No doubt. And, I, you know, I think people in sports are generally optimists. You know, the business now, obviously, the CFOs and the chief revenue officers are maybe feeling the pinch, but people in sports tend to feel very optimistic about about sports coming back. But I think all of us in the industry sort of look at that year and we it was 21. It's 22. It's easily 23 before we see normalcy. And maybe like Jim said, it, you know, it, it could easily be further with that you know, in mind, I'm getting some really good questions coming in over the, the chat, um, and which, which I want to get to, you know, where's financing coming from? You know, where, are, where are, where's money flowing into the sports business? And, and are they able to look over the horizon and see a more normal uh, pattern in, in sports? Uh, you know, sports is somewhat immune to economic downturns. This is not an economic downturn. In fact, if anything, the economy would seem to be chugging along quite nicely. This is a, uh, a health risk issue, um, which has overreaching um, impact in the, in the economics of sports. So where, where's money coming from? So I, I can take I can take this and I guess I'll start with uh, the, the second part of, of your question. I, I, I do think uh, from a, you know, from a capital perspective, uh, you know, people are looking out beyond the turbulence of the next couple of years. Uh, that, that is definitely the case. Uh, and I think, you know, the financing has come from and continues to come from the traditional sources uh, during this period. I think from a facility perspective, you're still seeing a lot of activity in the bank market. Uh, banks have their own unique considerations um, that they need to think about in terms of, you know, holding back capital, which was an issue sort of at the beginning of this period. So that capital was maybe a little bit more expensive, but not not unavailable. Um, and and you know, when you go into the long term market, uh, you know, bond investors, that's been a very strong market as well. Uh, like I said, I think you know most people, you know, continue to be focused on how are we going to get through. Um, you know, the next few years, do you have the liquidity to do that? Do you have the support from an owner potentially uh, if you don't have direct liquidity? So focused on, you know, if we can get through this blip, then, you know, the, the long-term prospects, I think everybody uh, it still agrees is very rosy for, you know, for, for major sports uh, overall. And, and so the, the financing market definitely is still there. I, I think there maybe has been a move towards some of the, you know, tr non-traditional type sources of capital, especially when you talk about, um, you know, not just facilities, but actually, you know, direct investments into, you know, into teams. So you're starting to see some of the leagues are um, exploring with institutional money being allowed into the ownership of teams. Uh, and, and that that increases liquidity. So that's becoming more common. I think that was uh, not necessarily something driven by, uh, by by COVID. I think that was happening previously and, and has more to do with, you know, the, the valuations of the teams and just general liquidity. Uh, but, but we're definitely seeing a little bit more of that. Um, clearly, uh, you know, that there's been activity in the SPAC market. There's probably 10 people on this call that have a SPAC uh, based on uh, <laughs> how frequently those, uh, you know, those seem to be coming out and that, that um, you know, there's definitely capital coming from that space. So Let's I think there is- what a SPAC uh, is for our, for our, our <laughs> may not know. 
So. Sorry, uh, the SPAC is a special acquisition corporation. It's effectively uh, an alternative way for a, a company to become uh, become public. Uh, you you issue uh, shares in, in a company, and then uh, that has a defined set of uh, potential acquisition uh, targets, and then you you acquire the company uh, at, at a later date. Um, but you know, that's that going to say that like there is a lot of capital uh, still flowing into the sports space. It might be a little bit different. Uh, it might be a little bit bumpy, but um, you know, it certainly hasn't uh, hasn't dried up, which which I think goes to show, um, you know, sort of the, the general viewpoint that that the future of uh, of sports is still very very rosy, despite you know the challenges that are definitely uh, yeah. in the coming years. Jim, are you seeing a lot of recaps, uh, you know, and recapitalizations and restructuring requests coming through your law firm? You know, well, yeah, I mean, just just in general, actually, we just. We, we've we just had two people come on in, in, in our London office that are kind of some of the preeminent uh, kind of worldwide uh, restructuring, bankruptcy, recapitalization, and, and look like in any um, this as you say this this is different than than kind of two thousand seven eight nine. Um, this, this, this is, there's just kind of this overhang, like I can't go out of my garage, uh, but everything's still kind of chugging along, as you say, because we're able to work because there are jobs and there, you, you know, I know there's a lot of people who are unemployment, unemployed and there's a lot of pain, which is out there. This is nothing like what happened after that. I, I mean, I think people are adapting to different ways of doing business. And ultimately, I think there are going to be, uh, including things like in ticketing and other electric electronic assets and things like that. I think you're seeing a lot of things being done in all kinds of industries, whether it's restaurants, retail, uh, and sports in particular. The, uh, um, but, but yeah, th 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 there's, there's a lot going on as opposed to, uh, you know, in kind of the recession, there was a lot that wasn't going on. I mean, I had a couple of facilities that I was working on. Unfortunately, they got funded right before kind of everything went in the hopper. And we, that was kind of what we were working on during that time period while everything was uh, kind of getting unfrozen. But you know, where I kind of look at it, and as Willie was saying as well, too, I mean, you're looking at, at what the, uh, at what cash looks like and the divisions of your cash, you know, and what Willie's talking about, I mean, those are things that, 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 that are, you know, longer term and have a longer gestation period and kind of more risk tolerance. The, the, the issue here of, you know, to kind of get back to uh, what is my broadcast revenue? That's, that's kind of a step down from that because people take a much longer view of that, particularly with national contracts and even the RSNs. Those tend to be, people take a longer view on that. But when I'm looking at how, you know, where you're dealing with things operationally, whether it's sponsorships, concessions, and gate, you know, kind of go down in terms of the immediacy of the need for those things. Um, sponsors, as I mentioned before, I think are, uh, um, and, and when you talk about recaps and things like that, I mean, those fall into that as well, too. Those are significant pieces of revenue, particularly when you're looking at naming rights. Um, those kinds of deals feed uh, right into project finance. And, and I think on the whole, uh, right now, um, at least what I've seen, the naming rights sponsors all kind of understand what the deal is. Their names are on the outside of buildings yeah. and such. It's not like they're completely reliant on in-stadium and arena activations and things like that. And so they're still getting kind of value, if you will, for their dollar. But there's a lot of people that are very much reliant on what's going on in the stadium. And I'll tell you, it's, 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 uh, I think everybody is working together because nobody wants to be the jerk on the other end of the uh, side of the tunnel here, particularly with- I like to be, I, I like to be that guy. <laughs> You know, but I, I think, uh, and, and you're seeing this play out uh, as well with, with with unique kind of deals that people are trying to do in the various leagues, the tarps, for instance, that they put out in the NFL, right? I mean, those, uh, I think when you talk to NFL people and others, uh, you know, they put a huge value on that. But when you actually watch what a game looks like, there may not be as much kind of exposure as people were wanting. And, and, and in some cases, more than people may have thought and some less. And so it's just an experiment that people are going through. And so, again, when, when you ask about recaps, I mean, I, I look at what do those revenue generating and those contractually obligated income types of pieces of, of your finance and of, of your assets look like. And, and people have to be very creative. And I think, uh, um, think way outside their risk box on both sides to, to deal with it. Um, the concessionaires are just getting killed, you, you know, because there's nothing going on in stadium. Oh, yeah. 
and they've got capital they've got to support. I mean, right. one of our, 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 our questions was, you know, are sponsorships going to be shorter? If things are coming up, you know, are they going to shorten down their sponsorships or, you know, or are we going to see them go longer so they can accommodate uh, these hiccups in the road? Have you, had, Jim, have you seen uh, contracts coming due or is everything kind of being pushed off for, for the moment? Um, no, nah, it's kind of both ways. I don't, I, I think at the end of the day, um, the people that are at the end of contracts right now are kind of holding off with what they're going to do. People that are in the beginning and the middle are, are working things out because they're taking the long view on things. In terms of new investment, and I think, you know, you've seen as well, too, there's been a number of pretty major naming rights uh, deals announced here in the past month. Right. I mean, people are still doing deals, uh, particularly if they're cornerstone kinds of deals that are associated with new facility builds or rehabs or things like that. I, I think that those are going to continue because you've got people that, that can weather the storm uh, yeah. who are willing to pony up that kind of money. I, I think where you're going to see the real pinch points are going to be people that um, maybe don't know what their business is going to look like, particularly in a, in a retail sector, particularly restaurants and other kind of consumer goods. Um, and, and I think those people are going to kind of hold back. In, in terms of duration, I, I don't know if people are going to intentionally do anything that's uh, longer or shorter. Those tend to have a, a life of their own that are built around certain things. In the Olympics, for instance, they're built around, you know, every quad and with the Olympics. I mean, we work, uh, all, all three of us do some work with Oakview Group, and we've seen them put up some great numbers sure. on some sponsorships. Yep, three, three big naming rights deals, right? Yeah, right. So yeah. It, I, I think it, it goes to say that even in the midst of a very, very interesting time, they've managed to secure some some pretty large numbers for, for a couple of projects that they're working on. So may, it's good to That's be in the midst of building a project, not having it just open right now where nobody nobody could be in it. You know, and I feel deeply for Los Angeles and uh, and Las Vegas who opened, you know, very marquee iconic stadiums in the midst right. of this without, without fans, which, you know, to my next question, all three of us work in this in this area, but you know, what does state and local government support look like now, you know, and going forward in, 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 in the sports facility world? Is it, you know, Willie, is it, is it, is it dialed back dramatically? Um, obviously, there's competing pressures and bu budgetary pressures, but um, what, what do you think it looks like? Yeah, you know, I, I think that there are competing pressures, as, as there always have been uh, in terms of, you know, the investment in these projects. I think that becomes more acute uh, as, uh, you know, as state and local governments, you know, try to understand what the impact is going to be on, on their, uh, on their budget. So I think the conversations become, you know, a little bit more difficult. Uh, I, I still think there is incentive to support projects that support, uh, you know, economic growth and activity uh, in your area. And certainly that's going to be something that, that state and local governments are, you know, very, very, uh, you know, going to think about very carefully to make sure that they can still encourage that. Uh, but, but I will say, you, you see buildings, and David, you and I have talked about this before. Uh, buildings that you know have ongoing maintenance needs that you know are either being unmet or have fallen to, uh, you know, fallen oh, yeah. to state and local governments that have you know budgetary pressures that they're facing now. And I think people are going to look closely to say, um, you know, how does this project fit into you know my overall. Uh, you know, overall budget and, you know, is it going to generate the economic drive that, you know, I really do need it to to make that investment worth it. And I think the answer in a lot of instances is going to be yes, but I think people are, are going to look closely uh, at, at whether or not it makes sense. So, you know, I, I don't expect there to be a, you know, meaningful, you know, increase uh, or, or decrease necessarily in the near term. Uh, but, but I think uh, those conversations will, will be, uh, you know, will have a lot more sides to them for sure. Well, especially in the communities where tourism dollars are supporting sports facilities. I mean, Las Vegas is a Correct. great example where they borrowed $750 million to support their contribution to, uh, to Allegiant uh, Stadium. But yeah, I think that that, that is definitely an issue. Jim and I were very fortunate to work on, as he mentioned, the Oakview Group project in Seattle, where the city of Seattle is not on the hook for budgetarily speaking for um, operating or capital contribution in, a, in, in, the, in the general sense of the word. They are they're providing the existing property, but they aren't um, responsible for an ongoing um, annual contribution to, to, um, 
to those buildings. And I think at this point where you've got buildings that aren't even being utilized or in the future, there's pressure to put money in for CapEx and making sure that these stadiums and arenas are at the highest level they possibly can be, um, where you've got a period of, of downturn or a period where under, they're underutilized, there's extreme pressure not to maintain the buildings and then put that back to the lo units of local government if they're involved. Yeah, I think- And, and I've-, I've... Go oh, ahead. I'm sorry, Jim, please. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say, I, I've heard this in the context of, of private financing, but, but I actually think it, it's applicable uh, in, in P3s as well. There's, a, there's an increased question of, you know, what's debt risk and what's equity risk? So who, who's going to bear the risk of, right. you know, in, in two years if things aren't back to normal or, you know, we aren't able to, to get to a place where we're back to 100%? Is that risk, you know, more, more you know, suited towards the equity and, and the team ownership? Uh, or you know, does it does it fall to the the municipality and, and in the private instance the the debt holders? And I think you're finding that that the the push is more that you know maybe that's something that fits you know more in equity risk and from a municipality perspective, it's how do I protect on on that downside? So those conversations have always happened uh, clearly, but I think it's become you know much more uh, you know much more at the forefront of uh, of these discussions as people start to think about what a what a partnership looks like. Yeah, and I, th I think in those partnerships, I think there were some trends that were developing before any of this, um, where, where especially on that CapEx load and to the extent it hasn't been offloaded on the team and it's on the city, um, particularly where you've got dedicated facilities, um, you're seeing uh, creative arrangements that were being done that really has led to an expansion of what teams are doing, whether it's the Packers title town, the Rockies have done a, a deal here, the Cubs have one outside their facility, where you're seeing kind of that natural kind of owner desired expansion into the real estate business as well too, and where the city may have property and say, look, you know, um, we don't want to bear the CapEx or have any responsibility for this. You take this property, you develop it, and, and you keep the income off of it, and then you use that to meet your obligations. I think that that's a, uh, uh, kind of another way of looking at these P3s and, and, uh, and, and just another way of, of finagling certain amounts of dollars because they got to come from somewhere and somebody's got to be able to pay for them and who's got the resources for it. And um, I think, you know, all of our, our sports clients have been willing participants to diversify their interests sure. outside of sports into other sure. real estate, uh, uh, either around their stadium or nearby. And so they can accommodate events and other types of activities from an yeah. activation standpoint that gives them the ability to, to really not just be in the sports business, but be in the entertainment business. So. Yeah. The, the other thing that's going to be real interesting, and look, I, I think it's a microcosm, but uh, um, that, that we may be experiencing in some tourism type of base states that are um, getting overrun during the pandemic. We are certainly here in Colorado. I mean, the mountains look like they're July 4th every other day uh, up there. And so I think that there was a lot of real concern from a municipality standpoint. And, and look, a lot of the mountain communities um, do, you know, major serious uh, events and sporting events and entertainment right. events that have big capital kind of needs for them. I mean, not on the, the scope of the $2 billion stadium, but, but major events that require a lot of capital to put off every Every year, put a lot of money into the economy and such. And, and, and I think, you know, when you're looking back in, in March and April, uh, everybody thought that, you know, they were all going to go bankrupt and, and nobody was going to have any money. Frankly, assessments, the way that they're trending up there and tax revenue base and things like that are far exceeding any kind of expectations they had in year to year are up by significant percentages. I know it's not like that everywhere in the country, but I mean, I do a lot of kind of sports entertainment work up in the mountains and uh, people are breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief. Uh, but, uh, um, you, you know, we can look around at any other number of, of golf events or serious professional events where these things that we're talking about with stadiums and things like that apply equally for their revenue, that uh, some places it's working and some places it's not. So that, you know, like I said, it could be an anomaly, but th th there is when you kind of look at this, when people hopefully are looking over their shoulder and this is done is, is you know, how much um, you, you know, economic uh, uh, blight did it uh, wreak on a particular community is going to differ from place to place, but uh, it, it may not ultimately be as bad as, as in some communities as they are in others. So that's, that's part of the calculus. In, in, in the real estate business, there's, there's always this sort of 
thought that the third person in is the one that makes money. It's not the, it's not the first person. Now in sports, it's a little bit different, but you know, what, what are the banks doing and what are the lenders doing to protect themselves right now? Are they, you know, at least from the legal standpoint, Jim and, 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 and Willie, from a financial standpoint, you know, what's non-relocation look like? What does force majeure look like? How are we protecting you? Now you've got teams playing in build home games and in buildings that they were never supposed to play home games in. So how are, how are lenders protecting themselves? What are they thinking about, you know, as they, as they ask the teams to sign on, what's a non-relo look like these days? You know, that's I, a loaded question, and I don't think any of us yeah, have an I, 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 I think it goes back to the, the, this whole idea of accommodation right now, right, is um, sports is playing an important part of having some normalcy in everybody's lives. So, that we're not on Zoom calls all day, right? <laughs> this is my fifth Zoom call today, so. Uh, but, uh, um, it, 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 and so again, to go back to the, I don't wanna be a jerk uh, kind of comment, I think that people that are in um, uh, high profile, high stakes relationships, uh, particularly where there's governments involved, I, I, I think that um, this isn't anything intentional that anybody's doing. To, to, to break it. I, I don't care what kind of contract we're talking about, reloads, sponsorship agreements, broadcasting, whatever. The, right. the, there's a certain element that there's nothing you can do about it, which, which does um, kind of involve force majeure and, and, and such. I mean, the, 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 my clients that I work with that do naming rights deals or facility deals or other things like that, after you've spent sometimes years on contracts, I, I always find it interesting that um, the, the comment that you most often hear is, I want to take this contract and put it in a drawer and never have to look at it again. Because <laughs> the, the relationship that we have constructed is reflected in the business operations, and that's how we want it to work. And so um, I, I know you have seen kind of during the pandemic a lot of uh, talk about force majeure and things like that. It, it, you know, there's a lot of lawsuits that are going on right now. I think uh, Under Armour and UCLA or in the Pac-12 or UCLA in terms of uh, Under Armour trying to get out of a contract, you know, based off of that. Um, I, I mean, the, the idea for force majeure typically is that it's a suspension of um, an obligation uh, that you have contractually because you just can't perform it. Um, it does uh, sometimes manifest itself in the ability to terminate if it goes on for a long enough period. So um, again, in, in this business, the most that, what I have seen predominantly is people trying to work things out because they wanna be business partners at the end of the tunnel where you're seeing those things get pulled out and used as an offensive weapon is where people typically are at the end of a deal that they really didn't like and they're trying to get out of it. That's a really good point. You know, I don't think you, 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 you underestimate the value of a contract and that where there's an opportunity to, to be partners, the contract doesn't drive it. It's good business judgment drives. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yep. I, uh, I, I, I can appreciate that. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, no, I guess I was going to say, but most of the investors in, in the space that I talk to on the debt side, um, you know, look at the world upside down. So, so it's not uh, what happens when things go right. It's, you know, what, what's going to happen when things go wrong. And so I, I think there's going to be an increased focus on, you know, what, what some of those provisions that, that people may not have focused on, you know, re really do mean. And, and I think that that manifests itself in, in a lot of different ways. I, I think on the one hand, you look at your revenue mix and, and you think, okay, if, if I'm backed by a sponsorship deal, that's a, you know, a, a deal on the stadium, very clearly that fits within the, you know, stadium, you know, sponsorship package. What happens if, you know, that to get the value out of that sponsorship, all of a sudden it shifted so that it's, you know, put down on the broadcast. Does that still, you know, how does that get allocated? And so I think there's going to be much more focus on, you know, the, the details of, you know, what underpins, uh, each of these deals and and you know not that those didn't matter uh, previously on the underlying deals but you know if you're saying that that uh, uh, you're willing to lend to something because it's 75% contractually obligated income where well 
you have to make sure that those contracts actually mean something in in an environment like uh, like we're seeing today. And so, you know, I think there is going to be a lot more uh, diligence done on the underlying uh, underlying contracts than uh, so it, previously seen. It puts a lot of pressure when you build a sports facility to make sure it's got alternative use too, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the days of single use sports facilities have been long gone. Um, but now it's not just two sports in a building, in an arena, or maybe a stadium. It's using it for, you know, all sorts of other events. You know, I think the Dolphins were incredibly creative in doing a, a drive-in movie uh, um, at, on their field. But you see, like, uh, the, the District Detroit and um, Little Caesars Arena, which was meant to be sort of a, a, a city built around sports, and, and so they've got – you know, not only the infrastructure and parking around it, but they've got restaurants and shops and, 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 and housing around it, it's offices. It's meant to be utilized all the time. So you don't have that exposure just to, you know, a single use for sports, you know, either, you know, 42 nights a year or 81 nights a year. It's, uh, it's, it's really going to be interesting to see how um, you project what utilization is going to be, which sort of brings me to my close to last question to both of you is that who's in the best position to, to recover from this, um, from a facility standpoint, from a league standpoint, you know, are we going to see consolidation in the business we have in the music industry and in the operators business, but you know, is Madison square garden in the best position or is it somebody in a, in a smaller rural community where traffic is really driving, you know, like Jim says, people are moving to the, to the mountains. <laughs> You know, and there's lots of activation. Where who's who's in the best position to recover? Well, the NFL is the obvious winner in everything, so you got to take them off the table, right? Okay. Who's next after that? MLB. Yeah, maybe. I you know I I you know I've been watching a lot of this a lot of the games in the bubble, but basketball. Of course, I'm a Heat fan, so you know, watching the the games in the bubble and like. Can you survive in that environment? What happens when you go back to your facility? You know, is, is the NBA find an answer to, to, uh, to, to not having fans? Did Major League Baseball find an answer? I think hockey pulled it off, right? They, they, they seem to have a pretty good response to the playoffs. And, uh, but, you know, so the leagues, I think, are okay. Do the, what about the individual teams? You know, are we gonna see more consolidation in ownership? You know. Um, you know, are we going to see um, um, promotion and relegation changed in the European football theater? You know, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. So I, I think there has been, you know, and, and obviously consolidation within leagues is is generally uh, not not allowed uh, by by league rules. But consolidation in sort of sports ownership across leagues is definitely something that we we've, we've seen a lot of, uh, and and I think there is you know, growing interest in that sort of beyond what's happening in the in the world today, uh, just in terms of creating a, you know, a company that that demands, you know, so many eyeballs from 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 all over the world. Um, and, and so I think that'll definitely continue. And I think folks who have been interested uh, in creating, you know, that that type of leverage, you know, certainly uh, have viewed there to be a potential opportunity to, you know, get in at a lower price point, um, whether or not that that's actually happening is a, is a different story. Um, so, so I think there is movement uh, on, on that space uh, for sure. Um, and, and in terms of, of promotion and relegation, I, 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 uh, it, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, I think makes the financing market uh, for, you know, European clubs, uh, you know, much, much different and in a lot of ways much more difficult. You know, that said, it, it's such an ingrained part of that culture, and, and I think it adds to um, you know, why people enjoy watching, uh, you know, watching so much. So I, I don't see it going anywhere. Um, but I, but I do think there's focus in the financing market of how do we structure around that risk? Um, if you're in the NFL, you're in the NFL. Uh, yeah. that is not the case with, with people in the premier league and, right. and, you know, other, uh, you know, other top leagues in, in Europe. So it definitely does make a difference. Um, but, but I don't, uh, I don't see that going anywhere. Uh, I think that if, if the if we all agree that the NFL is probably at the top of the heap economically speaking in the United States, um, and MLS being so dependent on ticket sales and 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 in, you know stadium revenues, you know I, there was a question posed a few months ago: Would MLS um, consolidate with like Liga Max? You know, does that make sense and have a more of a North American feel rather than just the United? Well. 
you know, the teams that are in, um, in, in the United States, uh, you know, do you, what do you think about that? Do you think that makes some sense? Um, would there be more likely to see international purchasing of sports teams, you know, where money is, seems to flow into the States, likes the stability, and you see a much bigger influence of international ownership in, in U.S. sports assets? Well, I, I actually think you're, on, on the international uh, on the international side, I, what I've seen has been yeah, actually the opposite. It's been U.S. money um, going towards uh, European, uh, particularly European soccer clubs. Uh, recently, there have been a number of investments, you know, across multiple leagues, um, you know, both at the very top and and you know at sort of the historically um, you know uh, middle middle tier of the top leagues, and even into you know even into the championship and and you know second. Uh, you know, second tier professional leagues. So you, you've definitely seen a noticeable uh, increase in investment going from the U.S. Uh, into Europe on on that front. Um, I, I, I haven't seen quite as much uh, coming, you know, internationally into the U.S., although, you know, I do think sports, at, you know, assets in the U.S. are, are increasingly attractive. Uh, it's just the price point is substantially higher for, you know, for point of entry. Um, you, you can get a very successful historic, uh, you know, Premier League club for many multiples less than you know what it would take to get into the MLS, and right. and I think that that definitely uh, changes the dynamics, and and that is partially because of uh, of the absence of, of promotion and relegation here in the U.S. Uh, but uh, you know it, it's uh, it's been interesting to see. Really? Yeah, the, the the valuations and uh, I mean MLS as we've talked about is is most at risk for something happening there just because. They also, they're, they're dependent on gate because they don't have a great TV contract at all. And, you know, they, they, they were working towards a, 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 a much larger TV contract than what they have now. I think they've got a 90 mil and they were looking at a 900. Okay. Um, and, and that obviously has been put on hold given what's, you know, happened here. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the one interesting thing about consolidation and other kind of assets which are out there that is really a little bit lost in the shuffle and, and also has been impacted particularly on the minor, you know, the baseball side with contraction happening in MILB is, you know, 20 years ago, kind of minor league sports and other things like that were things that, you know, we all would get together and get our high school buddies and college buddies together and kind of throw in and, and invest in, in, in some kind of team and have a stadium and lease with the city and things like that. Th those have become very lucrative investments. Those have become the topic of uh, a lot of purchases and sales. And, um, you know, it's an issue on the minor league baseball side, even before the pandemic occurred, that, you know, there are people that are just going to have their investments wiped out because of the contraction that was going to happen there. Mm -hmm. But there's plenty of profitable um, uh, junior hockey teams, which are out there and semi pro teams, uh, baseball teams in particular. And, and these guys are all also getting killed, given that, that they are very kind of heavily right. uh, gate dependent there as well, too. So I, I would foresee as this thing has, if it goes on, that there's going to be a lot of interesting opportunities um, there in that space. And consolidation isn't necessarily prohibited uh, in, in that aspect. So I think, you know, you see, you'll see a lot of movement potentially happening there if this continues on. And there's a lot of really great value, I think, which is there. Well, so in my, our last minute or two, I'm going to ask you one final question. And um, a lot of people think there's just too many dollars chasing too few assets. It's driven up valuations. Sponsorship deals are out of control. Players are getting paid too much money. Is this pandemic a global reset on revenues, on salaries, on just the whole perspective of the sports business? Or do we still see the trajectory moving upwards uh, across valuations across revenues i think i know your answers but i'm interested to hear what you said yeah <laughs> yes, kind of in exactly <laughs> <laughs> willie go ahead, go ahead no no i i uh, i i feel very similarly um you know, I, I think you're seeing uh, in, in terms of, you know, even what you mentioned, uh, you know, sponsorship deals that have been signed, naming rights deals that have been signed um, as people look towards, uh, you know, renewals on their media contracts. Uh, I think you're going to continue to see, uh, you know, an expansion on those. And, and you know, I think the, the, the valuations on the teams, you know, I, I think people feel comfortable that, uh, you know, they're, they're still, you know, economically great investments. And, and so I, I, I think that, you uh, 
you know, generally people feel very, uh, very strongly about that. And I agree. Yeah. Jim, yep. last word. That there is a pent up demand for sports. I think people will kind of go rushing back to it. I mean, to go back to the movie example, I don't know how quick I'm going back to a movie theater, but I'll go to a sports event outside any day of the week. Um, but it, 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 it's part of our culture. Um, it's become even more so with uh, the increasing marriage with the music and entertainment industry. People just seem to seamlessly flow between each other. It's part of popular culture and it's a part of our society. And I, I just, it's not going away. And it, it, there's a little bit of pause on things right now. And I, I think absent a uh, huge crash like we had with the recession, it's going to continue on. But that gets us back to the beginning and kind of the elevator down. I mean, I. I don't know when we get to the bottom floor. I mean, it kind of feels like you're there, but I mean, that's like that cartoon I sent you earlier, David, with the monster hanging out in the background. Right. This is November on its chest, and there's a car driving through with October on it. We don't know what's going to happen. No. I mean, that we'll we'll call that the last word, and we're at the end of our appointed time. Look, I, I um two 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 thoughts. Thank you so much for joining me in doing this. I I am certain that our students and other faculty that joined us really appreciate it. I'm a bit um, concerned that we didn't get as many people um, because this is such a great opportunity to hear from people that are professionals in the business. And um, I would just put out a word that this is, meets every week at the same time, five to six different topics on Wednesdays throughout the semester. Please join in, tell your friends and um, uh, that it's definitely worthwhile. You two have made my afternoon. It was really great to talk with you about this. We talk about this. We do this all the time, every day, actually, but it's fun to do it um, with others listening in. So thanks so much um, for that. I really appreciate it. Um, have a nice evening, everyone that joined us, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing um, your guys' thoughts again in another episode sometime soon. Bye. Thanks so much, David. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.